Hello everyone, and welcome to another edition of Weapons and Warfare. I'm your host, Ryan Robertson, and if you are a fan of the show, you might notice I'm not in my normal surroundings. That's because we are coming to you from the Air and Space Forces Association's Warfare Symposium, hosted in lovely Aurora, Colorado. Fun fact, I actually learned how to ride dirt bikes about 25 minutes away from here. Uh, on the episode this week, we have a great conversation with a Dutch military officer, Major Marnix Provost. He's actually studying for his doctorate, and part of his research was writing a paper called The Theory of Russian Victory, and it's a great conversation. Definitely want to stick around for that. Our weapon of the week this week is a new thermal optic. It could be a game changer for precision shooters. I don't want to give too much away, but you're definitely going to want to stick around for the weapon of the week because the, the clarity on this thermal imaging sensor is just out of this world. But it wouldn't be weapons in warfare if we didn't start with some headlines from around the world. So let's go ahead and dig into it. Over the last two years, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent war has set many new precedents. And now we have another combat first. According to the Ukrainian organization Army of Drones, Ukrainian UAV operators used an airborne drone to spot for a ground-based drone that had a machine gun turret mounted to it. The dynamic drone duo was able to target and eliminate multiple Russian positions. And previous videos posted to Telegram and Twitter of other operations show just how effective ground-based drones can be. In one of the most effective instances, a small drone loaded with explosives traveled more than two miles through enemy territory to take out a bridge. It's like a macabre modern-day little engine that could. In an effort to bolster recruiting numbers, the Navy says you no longer need a high school diploma or GED to enlist. Potential recruits can now put their name on the dotted line as long as they score 50 or higher on the Armed Forces Qualification Test. This move comes just days after each branch's highest ranking senior enlisted leader testified in front of Congress that pay reform, better benefits, and improved housing are the service's biggest needs when it comes to recruiting new troops. We can't have service members distracted by whether or not they're able to live in safe and affordable housing, whether or not they have access to child care and health care, or any other challenges unique to serving our nation to include pay and compensation. Chief Bass went on to say the last time there was a targeted pay raise for service members was 2007. Nigeria's new plan to deal with Islamist insurgents and bandits includes a pit of vipers. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Not literally, of course. No, a dozen AH-1Z Viper attack helicopters are headed to Nigeria. Vipers are good for recon, escort, and strike missions. The DOD recently announced final approval of the sale, giving it the green light. But the details were originally hammered out back in 2022. An additional $7.7 .7 million deal was awarded to Northrop Grumman to provide 32 mission computers for the Bell helicopters. The contract is expected to be completed in June. This month marks the two-year anniversary of Vladimir Putin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. When Russian troops crossed the border on February 24th, 2022, few predicted how the war would turn out. Fewer still predicted a practical stalemate two years in. For Ukraine, victory means one thing, a complete Russian withdrawal. For Putin, victory is more complex. To get a better understanding of what that could look like, I recently spoke with Max Provost, a major in the Royal Netherlands Army working as a PhD researcher at the Netherlands Defense Academy. And it's in this capacity, as an academic, that he agreed to speak with us, because he is also the author of a piece published by the Modern War Institute called What is Russia's Theory of Victory in Ukraine? You have like four possible outcomes in a war, and the highest achievable is a political victory, Below that lies a military victory, below that lies a military defeat, and below that lies a political defeat. While those may seem cut and dry, according to Max, they are not. And it may ultimately be what Russia is angling for. Because if you uh, suffer a military defeat, but you are Ill still able to create a political narrative that implies a political victory, um, then it's 
that last last thing that counts, um, the political victory. On the surface, it might seem like the war is about Russia taking back something that was once theirs. But as the major explains, much of Putin's actions are about preventing what a free Ukraine would look like to Russian citizens. If the Russian people see that adopting a different political and economic system can bring them more freedom and prosperity, and that they aren't necessarily deterministically bound by a narrative that the people suffer and uh, uh, serve the state, then that might cause some instability in Russia because people start questioning the Russian authoritarian rule and the um, oligarchic uh, economy that is currently uh, uh, active in the country. To some extent, at least for now, Putin has what he wants, the delayed growth of democracy in Ukraine. Ukraine, I think, has uh, written down in its constitution that as long as the country is in a state of emergency or in fact at war, no democratic elections uh, should be held. And uh, there was a lot of discussion by the end of last year whether Zelensky should hold elections or not. In the end, I think he decided not to do so. It's hard to say you uh, have a democracy if you're not going to hold a democratic vote, right? Yeah, and I I, I don't want to judge his decisions. Of sure. course, there there are but lots from, from of From the uh, Russian propaganda factors. perspective, like, we stopped, we stopped their vote, so... That's the first brick. To, I mean, from from Russia's perspective, that's the first brick to fall to tearing down the democracy. Stop the vote. exactly. And you you see that uh, Zelensky's political opponents, his political opposition, um, they questioned his decision not to hold elections anymore. And while supporters of Ukraine continue to push for more money and hardware, the major says that might not be the best path for victory. Strategy implies letting Ukraine become a true democracy against all odds, but showing that despite Russia's efforts, they still can hold elections, they still have a true uh, democracy with opposition, etc. And the other thing is to get that economy uh, viable again. And that means that uh, you need, I think, to um, get Ukrainian export uh, through the Black Sea open again. Max, hopefully uh, the powers that be will listen to you. And in a couple of months, uh, we can circle back and there will be a completely different narrative to talk about, right? I mean, we can hope for that, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right, sir. Uh, really so, well, appreciate thanks it. for having me. Yeah, absolutely, sir. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks again to Major Max Provost. Great minds are always welcome here. And if you want to hear our full conversation, be sure to check out a bonus episode of our podcast that will be out later this week and is available at all the podcast places. The late David Hackworth once said, if you find yourself in a fair fight, you didn't plan properly. With that in mind, the retired army officer and journalist would probably love our weapon of the week. That's because in the hands of the right person, the Teledyne Hiss HD long range cooled sniper sight is all about creating unfair advantages. Introduced to the public at this year's SHOT Show in Las Vegas, the sight is likely to be an immediate hit with precision shooters and it's easy to see why. First, it mounts right to the rifle, essentially a clip-on that sits in front of the rifle's optics, making it an easy-on, easy-off tool for operators conducting reconnaissance, force protection, and forward observation missions. It's built by FLIR, the same folks that developed the thermal imaging gear, which allows firefighters to find hot spots when trying to put out flames, or helicopter crews to find people on the ground. The new site offers long-range optics and an HD display with detailed imagery for snipers and machine gun crews. How detailed? Users can expect high-resolution views at more than 7,000 feet. That's more than a mile. And that high-def view means shooters are able to see fired rounds in flight, even without tracers, day or night. That means shooters can target adjust on the fly, without a bunch of bright tracer rounds, giving away their firing positions. When talking about their newest product, Teledyne's Vice President of Surveillance, Strategy, and Development says the new thermosite Hiss HD is the unmatched choice for precision shooters looking for a versatile, lightweight thermal sight that increases their range and accuracy. 
with His HD, we've leveraged our world-class thermal imaging technology to provide marksmen with a superior tool to identify and engage targets anywhere in any environment. Weighing less than five pounds with the batteries and measuring a little more than 10 and a half inches long, FLIR says the sight will triple the performance on machine gun sights and doubles it when compared to existing thermal sights designed for sniper rifles. All right, folks, it's time once again for one of my favorite segments of the show. It's called Comms Check. It's our opportunity to kind of check in with you, the viewers and listeners. And, you know, we peruse our social media feeds. We check our inboxes for any questions or comments that you have out there um, and try to answer those to the best of our ability. So let's go ahead and get started. The first Comms Check this week comes to us on a story that we had done on some Ukrainian special operations forces who had used uh, unmanned surface drones, uh, sea babies is what they're called, to take down another Russian missile boat. Uh, the missile boat was the Ivanovitz, and there were six sea babies that attacked and, and took the, um, the boat down. And I started the story off uh, in our vertical version of the story that aired on you know TikTok and YouTube shorts. I said, oh, they did it again. Ukraine sank another boat. Well, that was enough to prompt this uh, uh, response from Mr. Mike Ali. Mike is saying, stop saying Ukraine did it again. I want Ukraine to win, but say NATO did it again. Uh, here's the thing, Mike. The only uh, forces fighting inside Ukraine right now are Ukrainian forces and Russian forces. NATO's not there. Yes, a lot of the countries supporting Ukraine also happen to be members of NATO. Uh, it's not too... Um, you know, far-fetched to imagine a world where that's possible since NATO, mostly European countries uh, in Ukraine happens to be in Europe. So while it's, while it's true that a lot of the support, a lot of the weapons systems uh, that Ukraine is getting uh, are from NATO allied countries and might be some systems that NATO also uses, uh, let's make a clear distinction here, Mike. NATO is not fighting a war against Russia right now. Ukraine is fighting a war against Russia. Russian propagandists want you to think that Russia is fighting a war against NATO because it helps justify their, their uh, illegal annexation of several um, parts of Ukraine. It also helps the Russians justify their uh, invasion into another sovereign country. But NATO and Russia not fighting a war right now. So Mike, I'm with you. I hope Ukraine wins also, but let's be clear. The fight is between Ukraine and Russia right now, and that's it. So, hope that answers your question. Let's go ahead and move on to our next comms check. And this story, uh, or this question comes to us on a story that we had done about Tower 22. Uh, this was the U.S. military outpost in Jordan um, that was struck by a, 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 another drone, an aerial drone operated by a militant group. Um, the drone was able to enter the airspace over the post and strike uh, some sleeping quarters. Dozens of people were injured and three U.S. service members were killed. So, Crash is saying, they are lying to us. No way they would have turned off radar just because our drone was coming in. They are lying once again. I'm not sure who they are, whether it's the government or DOD or just some boogeyman who makes things up, uh, but Crash, um, to your point of they wouldn't have turned off the radar, well, they didn't turn off the radar. The U.S. military uh, personnel that were operating at Tower 22, uh, they turned off the air defenses because they thought it was a U.S. drone that was returning and not a militant drone that was attacking. So the air defense system, which is actually, uh, we'd done a weapon of the week on one of the systems employed at Tower 22, it's called the Coyote uh, system from Raytheon, they have those there at Tower 22. But they were deactivated, again, because they, uh, the personnel there thought it was a U.S. manned drone returning. Um, many of the drones that, that these militant groups are using in Syria and uh, Iraq and Jordan and, and that Yemen, that whole area, they're all Iranian made and Iranian designed. And some of those Iranian designed drones do look an awful lot like American drones because they're basically ripoffs. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily outside the realm of possibility to think that this drone operated by a militant group, which looks potentially like a U.S. drone, which means it would probably have a similar radar uh, signature to a U.S. drone, was mistaken for a U.S. drone. Uh, now, 
does this mean that the U.S. military needs to kind of readjust their uh, method of operations when drones return to base? Maybe, especially if militants in the area are picking up on what those protocols are. Uh, but to your point, Crash, no one is lying about the radar being down because nobody ever said the radar was down. The air defenses were taken down, uh, but the radar um, would, would stay up. Radar in and of itself does not have the ability to take down any craft necessarily. It's more about tracking where those craft are and where they're going. So Crash, hope that uh, clears some things up for you. Uh, for you viewers and listeners out there, if, if there's something on the show that you see here um, and, you know, you want an answer to it or you have a comment that you would like to, uh, to, to make known to the world, please do so. It might be featured on a future uh, segment of comms check. Also, you can feel free to send us an email, weaponsandwarfare at san.com, all spelled out weaponsandwarfare at san.com. Uh, we check that as well. So all of our social feeds, our email, if you want to get in touch with us, that's how you do it. And uh, hopefully your comment or suggestion or whatever it may be gets featured on the next episode of Weapons and Warfare. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. Well, folks, we are just about ready to put a bow on this episode of Weapons and Warfare. But before we say goodbye, I want to wrap with something that we talked about at the beginning of the show. The story about unmanned aerial vehicles in Ukraine used as spotters for unmanned ground vehicles armed with turrets taking out multiple Russian positions. For anyone paying attention to the fighting overseas, it is blatantly obvious that warfare has changed and it continues to change. Necessity is still the mother of invention, though, and the situation in Ukraine right now dictates in order for Ukraine to simply compete with, let alone defeat, a much larger Russian force, it needs to make use of new technology and exploit it to the fullest. And a lot of that technology here at the Warfare Symposium is very similar to, if not the exact same technology that's being used in Ukraine right now. It's cutting edge, it's advanced, it's all the adjectives you can think to describe it, but let's not forget it's dangerous too. And not just because these are weapons, but because of what these weapons can do and what they do to their users. Much like the predator drone strikes of the Obama administration, which were highly criticized for killing indiscriminately and often attacking misidentified targets, removing the human from the front line may preserve the body, but it could also leave the mind in tatters. Many of the predator pilots from the Obama era reported suffering from PTSD. So much like militaries the world over are learning how to improve war fighting based on lessons from Ukraine, I'm hopeful the US military learned from our own nation's past with drones and recognizes that as much as warfare looks like video games today, there is no rebooting or respawning in the real world and the effects of the battle will last a whole lot longer than the time it takes to recharge the controller. But that's going to do it for us here this week for Weapons and Warfare. If you have any thoughts that you want to share with us, please do so on our social media feeds. You can also email us at weaponsandwarfare at san.com. But for senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphic designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Straight Arrow News, signing off. Mm -hmm.